Thank you very much, Peter. So when I was asked to do this panel, I was thinking about what scaling African business means. And actually, yesterday's keynotes gave me the ideal platform to start with. So yesterday, we heard from the president of Ghana about Afropolitans. He talked about individuals who come from one place, who speak multiple languages, who've gone to school at Oxford, and who've gone and done incredible things all over the continent and all over the world. And then we also heard from Tony Elamelu about Afropolitanism, right? And about Afro capitalism, sorry, and about how capitalism in Africa is creating new ways of doing business and how African firms are really leading that charge. Today, we're going to hear from three people who have all kinds of different perspectives on these two issues. These firms are moving all over the continent, from outside of the continent into the continent, and then also from the continent outside into the rest of the world. And today, we're going to think about the ways in which these things have worked, some of the challenges that each of you has faced doing this, and some of the opportunities that we see in what is a billion person market, but which is, and I'm so pleased that I don't have to tell this to you, not a single country. <laughs> so we'll start today with Acha Leke. Acha is the director of McKinsey. He is a senior partner based in Joburg. He first joined the firm in the US 15 years ago and transferred back to Joburg in 2002 to help expand the firm's activities in sub-Saharan Africa. He went to Lagos in, 20, in 2010 to open the firm's newly established office and returned to South Africa in 2014. He's a member of the McKinsey Global Institute's Council, and he's currently leading the firm's expansion efforts across Francophone Africa. He has a PhD from Stanford in electrical engineering. He also received an MS in electrical engineering and an MS in industrial engineering. He's an engineer. From <laughs> from Stanford, and he received a Bachelor of Electrical Engineering, summa cum laude with a minor in economics from Georgia Tech in the US, where he was the first black valedictorian in the school's history. <laughs> we'll then move on to Harish Asw Aswani, who is the CEO of Tolarum Group. And he has almost three decades of experience in Nigeria, where he's also been instrumental in helping the group's businesses grow. He, the group, Talarum Group, employs close to 8,000 people and runs some of the most successful brand businesses in Nigeria, which you'll hear about today. He's been a keen promoter of developing business in Nigeria. He's been named Outstanding Industrialist. He's received the prestigious National Honor of MFR, which is a member of the Order of Federal Republic of Nigeria, in 2006. And he's currently spearheading the group's venture on infrastructure development in Nigeria, specifically with the Lekki port, which is the Nigeria's first private and largest deep sea port. Once completed, this milestone project is going to be a catalyst for the region. He's also an avid supporter of the arts and of African artists. And then finally, we'll have Patuma Nefleke. That's my best effort on that. Um, <laughs> um, who is the chairman of the MTN Group and former CEO of the MTN Group. Um, as CEO of MTN, Mr. Neko, sorry, Mr. Neko um, was appointed a board of directors at, for the GSM Association, which is a global trade association for mobile phone operators. He also spearheaded the company's in entry into Nigeria and its growth in that area and a number of external outward FDI activities which we'll hear about. Um, he's also the chairman and one of the founding members of Worldwide African Investment Holdings, which is an investment holding company with interests in petroleum, telecommunications, and information technology. He helped build the company to a book value of investments of about 3.5 billion rand. He's a director of Johannic Holdings. He has a, a BSc in civil engineering from Ohio State and an MBA in finance from Atlanta University. We have many engineers on the panel. So thank you all very much for joining us. And Acha, I'll let you begin. Um, thanks, thanks, Catherine. Um, and uh, again, it's great to be here. I, I was telling the dean, as you know, um, I've been at McKinsey 15 years, so I have hired hundreds of people from Oxford, but I'd never been to Oxford. Um, so I thought at least I should come and, uh, and check out the beautiful campus. Um, but just back to the, the, the topic, right, on, on sort of scaling up businesses across Africa, I thought I'll just uh, provide a bit of context um, and then let, uh, you know, 
um, the, the, the other panelists talk more, more practically about you know, the businesses and how they scale up the businesses. So a couple of things on, first, why, why are businesses doing this across Africa, right? And I think many of the facts we already know around how, um, but we shouldn't take it for granted, right? How in, as a continent, we are the second fastest growing region in the world after emerging Asia. We've been that for the last 10 years. Projections are that we will continue to be the second fastest growing region in the world for the next 10 years, right? So that's um, uh, partly why, why this is exciting. Uh, but secondly, in addition to that, Africa offers the second highest return on investment of any region in the world, right? So if you have, I always say, you have a pound to invest uh, in Africa, you'll get the second highest return, right? And honestly, that is why businesses are here. Uh, they're here because they want to make money. They also want to contribute and add value to the economy and to the societies. But at the end of the day, if we were not offering those kinds of returns, they would not uh, uh, be here. So we should, we should remember that. Um, thirdly, as we know, there's an amazing consumer story, right? So I... Um, do a quite a bit of private equity work. And, and you know, out of the last 10 due diligences we've done, I'll say eight have been in all the consumer-facing sectors, right? So people are coming in and saying, let me get in early and ride the wave. You know, half of Africans are under the age of 19. And you get in early and just imagine what you can do if these, these, these um, people become your, your, these consumers become your customers now and, you know, over the next 30, 40 years. So it's an amazing uh, consumer story. But part of it is also that, and that's part of the challenges, is that, you know, uh, like Catherine said, it, we talk about Africa, but it is 54 countries, right? And so, and we don't have too many at scale countries. So if you want to, you know, have a meaningful business, you know, you could be in Nigeria, you could build a meaningful business, and many people have done that. Uh, you could be in South Africa, but, you know, outside of those two, are probably Morocco, Egypt, but outside of those two, to build a really meaningful business, you have to diversify. You have to um, operate across many of these countries that <laughs> we always, had one of our clients who said, look, you know, we are in 30 countries across Africa. They were sort of down, downstream retail. Um, you know, every year, five countries are going to blow up, right? We don't know which ones they are, um, but 25 will do great, right? And will do very well. And for 30 years, that's what happened to them, right? And so this diversification has helped many companies uh, 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 in a certain way to also mitigate against the risk, which is part of uh, the realities in Africa. So I think, you know, it's this thing about, so that's why it's attractive why companies do it. Now, if you reflect on the journey, right, I always say we started with, you know, the MTNs, the sort of South African companies that expanded across, across the continent. And, you know, MTN is one, but you have, you know, NASPERS with DSTV, you have ShopRite, we were talking about that earlier. Um, then, then the next wave was sort of the Moroccans, and it wasn't even North Africa, it was more Moroccans, right? So the banks from Morocco, the telcos from Morocco buying, and that was mainly into, into Francophone Africa, right? But they built, you know, and the insurance companies now from Morocco as well. And then you have, you know, the Nigerians, right? And we heard Tony yesterday, you know, first time, you know, we worked with him, he was in one country in Nigeria. Uh, today he's in 19 countries with the bank, with UBA. And you have a number of the banks in Nigeria. Then you have Aliko uh, Dangote as well. Um, and I'm sure you can talk about the Tolerant Group. So, so you have primary, it's not even West Africa, I think it's actually more the Nigerians, right, that have done it. And then you have the odd entity out of Togo, which is Ecobank, uh, which is based out of Togo, but then they've done it. And then a bit in East Africa, but it's really still dominated very much by South, if you think just across Africa, by South Africa, a couple of Moroccan companies, a few Nigerians, Echo Bank, and a bit in East Africa, right? And the question hopefully we'll come back is, how do you create, you know, 10 more such companies across Africa? What is it going to take? Um, and so you just think about what it takes and, you know, based on, you know, our experience as McKinsey growing from one office in South Africa to seven across the continent, but also mainly supporting uh, African um, uh, uh, regional champions, as we call them, but also MNCs as they work to expand across Africa. A, a couple of points, uh, and, and then I'll end. One is, you know, we fundamentally believe that to, to get this right, you need support from the top. And this is mainly for the multinationals, right? You need, you know, the board, the chair, the chairperson, the CEO, the executive uh, at head office to really buy into the Africa story, right? And we've done this with the Lions in the Move report we, 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 uh, we released a few years ago. We've you know, spoken to 100 boards, and many of these companies come and tell us, look, instead of us going, you know, the head of Africa going and saying, oh, please give me more money for Africa, they're like, it's better for, you know, an independent party like you, McKinsey, come and sort of convince the board. And we've done that, you know, uh, many, many times. And, and what you see, you can tell the boards who are, you know, we get it, it's a long-term play. There are going to be challenges which we'll talk about. But if you take a long-term perspective, we have to be in Africa, right? Look at a GE, look at a Coke, look at a Citibank, those kinds of players, that's what that, that and they get it, right? Um, and it's for different reasons. I remember when we were doing the Lions on the Move work, um, we went around the world to tell the story, and I was in uh, Korea, one of the Korean uh, conglomerates there, presenting to the chairman. And literally, he, you know, he knew nothing about Africa, but he's just like, look, my Chinese competitors are going there. I don't know what they're looking for. 
I need to understand. <laughs> and, uh, and then so we take the first page and it has a map of Africa and he's like, oh, but you know, you made a mistake. Why do you have two Congos on the map? And I was like, oh, <laughs> it's, it's two separate countries. <laughs> but that's, that's the little he knew about the continent. But for him it was, you know, we need to be there. And actually now they've built a quite a sizable business across Africa. So support at that top where the top buys into it is very critical. Um, the second is, you know, is we talk about big granular, right? We talk about, you know, 54 countries, but, you know, we tell our clients it's actually, you should not think countries, you should think cities, right? So it's not which five countries should I be in, it's which 20 cities should I, should I go into, right? And that's really how you, you need to translate it. And, 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 you know, 20 cities in Africa account for what, you know, 60, 70% of the GDP, right? But, you know, is it a, do I go to the next, you know, to, I don't know, you know, Freetown, or should I expand into, you know, the fourth city in Nigeria, right? Those are the kind of questions a lot of our clients are, are, are talking about. Uh, but granularity is, 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 is absolutely uh, critical. Being on the ground is important. I'm sure Tuma is going to talk about it, but being on the ground present. I mean, I flew every week from South Africa to Nigeria for five years um, before I decided to move. And I was like, well, you know, I'm there every week. What difference does it make? It made a fundamental difference when I moved, right? Because, you know, you see people on the weekend, you're not flying leaving to catch a flight, it just makes a massive difference. And I was just remembering one of our clients, um, we were talking to, and you know, they're looking to get into Nigeria, it's a South Africa, it's a conglomerate, but they're based in South Africa for the Africa business. And I just met with the guy who runs the Africa business last week, and he's like, okay, look, you know, I'm trying to get my guys around, we need to enter Nigeria, right? So we're gonna have a Nigeria strategy session, but we're gonna do it in Ghana. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I don't understand. He's like, no, because our guys in the Middle East, they're scared of Nigeria. So who can I invite from Nigeria to Ghana to come and talk about Nigeria? <laughs> and I was like, honestly, the best you can do is convince these guys to come to Nigeria for the strategy session. And he sent me an email a few days ago and said, look, April, August 31st, I've convinced them we're going to do it in Nigeria, right? So, so you absolutely have to be on the ground. Because uh, I say for every person who's not there, you have five people on the ground getting things done. Um, the fourth is about becoming local, right? So finding a way to, you know, you'll have to bring in expats at the beginning, but you're really hiring local talent. And you know, you have to think of it very differently. So when we opened the McKinsey office uh, in Nigeria the first year, we got 1,500 applications. We got uh, 1,000 from Nigeria, from schools in Nigeria, and we had 500 from schools outside, including Oxford. Um, of those 500, we hired 12. Of the 1,000, we hired none, right, nobody. And I was like, there's just no way, I mean, these people are smart people, like, why can't we find, you know, the right people in Nigeria? Because we didn't want to have an office. We could feel the office was just repats, right, people coming back. And it was not just repats, it was, you know, it was, it was Chinese, it was Brazilians, it was uh, Belgians, all wanted to come and experience Nigeria. Uh, but then, you know, we started working very closely with the universities um, and said, you know, we need to, what are we doing? You know, these are smart people, but, but again, just in terms of how, and we know the education system of the continent is quite, is, is, it's quite messed up you know, around the kind of problem solving we need, what we expected. But we also needed to tailor a bit, you know, our program, we extended it to a three-year BA program, and now we're getting a number of people come through the process, right? And you know, I said the first, the first five BAs we hired through this process are all unfortunately at HBS, we're working on, on Oxford. <laughs> um, uh, but, but, you know, but they're very successful, right? But we needed to tailor our model. It was gonna be very easy to say we can't find people here, let's just get people from outside and import them back into Nigeria. I think being local and hiring people, getting, finding the right local partners is, is quite critical. And then finally, and I was having a conversation with somebody today about this, is you know, I always say you, know, you can absolutely operate according to your values in any country in Africa, right? So people always say, you know, do you have to pay bribes? Do you have to? And I'm like, absolutely not, right? So we operate according to our values. People know that. I remember when we had um, the first uh, work permits we needed to get, took forever to get, right? And, uh, and clearly some people came to us and said, look, you know what, if you needed to accelerate the process, we can help you. Um, and we were like, we just, we just can't, we just don't do that. Um, and then eventually it came through. Um, and then, but the next ones are very easy. And we fundamentally believe that what happened is that in that office, they said, look, if it's McKenzie, don't worry with them, right? You know, they'll never pay. <laughs> just get it over with, find somebody else who will pay and go bother them, right? And, uh, and that's been the process, right? And so I think, you know, I would encourage you all as you set it up, as you think about setting up your own companies, you just remember you can absolutely operate according to your values and do, do well and do good uh, on the continent. Um, uh, the one thing I would say uh, in closing is just companies have recognized this, right? And we, we'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll spend a lot of time today talking about challenges, but companies have recognized this on the continent. We, uh, we, we, have, we, we started creating a database of the number of companies that um, uh, uh, make a billion dollars or more in revenue in Africa, right? And I always actually ask my audience, um, those who know don't answer, but you know, how many companies do you think make a billion dollars in revenue in Africa today? 
Sorry. Hello? Oh, she says one, Dangote. <laughs> Any others? 300? 55? 15? Right, so the, the 465 companies today that make a billion dollars in revenue in Africa, right? 10% of the Fortune 500 companies. So, I mean, something is happening, you know, they're there because they want to make money. And in many cases, I show you about the return, right? The margins in some cases are quite are higher. The risks are there, right? But if you find the right business model, you can make money. So, um, so very exciting time to be on the continent. I think uh, uh, I haven't spoken much about the challenges. I'm sure we'll come back to it, but I just thought I'll focus about the opportunity and why companies are, are excited about scaling up on the continent. Uh, I'm going to tell you a story, a story of my family, of what we did in Africa. And uh, I'll start off by, first of all, uh, thanking all of you here. I'm very honored and proud to be in Oxford. Honored that I can speak to all of you here. And also, I'm very proud that my daughter goes to school here. So, I know she's in front of me here. Give you a bit of background. I'm an Indian. I was born in Indonesia. I went to school in Malaysia. I furthered my studies in the States. I'm a Singapore citizen, and I live in Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs> so, when I give you this presentation, I'm actually giving you a global perspective of how I see Africa as a global citizen. Now, I'm going to start this... Uh, it? Oh, it's up here. Wonderful. <laughs> okay. This goes. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our family, what we do, what's our family business, and I'll run through it very quickly. We were founded in 1948. We have our headquarters in Singapore. And I call Singapore a Hoover machine because it just sucks all the profit from me. Uh, we focus on emerging markets, uh, primarily in Asia and Africa. And we focus on consumer goods, digital services, energy, and infrastructure. It's a family-owned business. We have seven shareholders, but it's truly run by professionals. Okay? The family members do not do day-to-day -day functions at all. It's all run by professionals. And Globally, we employ 9,000 people, and I'm glad to say that we are one of the companies in Africa that has a revenue of above a billion dollars. Uh, this is just a short uh, slide to show you where we are in Africa. Ivory Coast, Ghana, Benin, Togo, Nigeria, Cameroon, recently DRC and Tanzania. How do we look at Africa? And Nikkei actually gave a very interesting start to that. It's one Africa, it's one big continent, but it's not one country. It's actually five regions. There are five economic regions in Africa. And it's 54 nations. And in Nigeria, what we have is three major, but 16 minor tribes. So when we look at Nigeria, when we walked in there, we had this in mind. We, we should look at Nigeria completely with eyes open about the sensitiv sensitivities and the cultural differences that are there in Nigeria. So we have to appreciate the culture when we walk into a country. We walk in there and say, Nigeria has three major tribes. You have the Yoruba tribe, the Hausa tribe, and the Igbo tribe. So it's a very multi... <laughs> hey! Kedu! <laughs> uh, so if you appreciate sensibilities, you start marketing your product about how do you go about doing it. So in the south, people are more from Bayan, so when you do packaging, you put a smiley lady's face, and in the north, it's a more conservative nod. So you put the Hausa man with the hat and, you know... <laughs> So we, we have to take all this into consideration. And what we have done in Nigeria is this, and it's a very interesting story for all of us, is that we have actually created an eating habit. Africans didn't eat noodles before we came in. And now we sell actually 4 million cartons times by 40, 160 million packs a month, which is equivalent to about 1.9 billion packs a year in Nigeria alone. So intermittent instant noodles is our success story there. But what do we look at when we look at things uh, in terms of marketing in Nigeria? So one of the key factors that we looked at was affordability. How do we bring products that are affordable because Africans don't have much money to spend? So we brought pack sizes that were affordable for people to buy day to day. So the Indomie pack sells for 20 cents a pack. You know, we have the min mini meat chin chin snacks which sells for 25 cents. Power oil sells at 50 naira which is 30 cents a pack. And the hypo bleach sells also for 15 naira, which is basically a 25 cents a pack. So we make it affordable for the consumers to go out there and buy. And another thing that we've kept in mind is this. 
Africans value quality. They're not out there to look for second-hand products or second quality. So in our case, Indomie actually commands a premium over all other brands, and there are 16 other brands selling with us in Nigeria alone, but we command a minimum 20% premium over the next brand. So Africans, when they buy products, they also look for quality. So this applies the same for all other products, whether it's milk, pasta, uh, seasoning, and all that. With this in mind, we built the strongest brand in Africa, and both Hypo and Indomie have been rated by Nielsen's as the fastest growing brand in Africa. So what are the things we have to take in mind when we, we work in Africa? Okay, there are changing regimes, there are changing policies, government changes, ministers changes. What happens? What do you have to do? You have to be on guard. You have to be alert. And I'm just showing you a slide from 1960 to 2012, what has happened. The good thing is that for the last 16 years, Nigeria has had a civilian government, and we are actually very proud that the last election pushed in the new democracy. And it's actually a very big statement for Africa itself. It's just not for Nigeria, but it's a continuation of democracy in Africa. And we hope with that, business will grow rapidly in Africa. Another thing to worry about is the fluctuating exchanges uh, in, in Africa all over. We have done businesses in quite a few countries, and we noticed that you have to be on guard. So what do you do? You mitigate the risk by taking foreign currency swaps, you plan ahead, you budget price increases, uh, you start looking at how do you reduce costs each year. So there are many things that you have to think about when you do business in Africa. I'm rushing through because I have a time limit, okay? <laughs> uh, what we did as a group was to mitigate risk, we did the value chain integration. So we did a backward integration for all our raw materials so that we are not dependent on just importing materials, we actually make the raw materials locally in Nigeria. So 91% of our raw materials are made in Nigeria. So the real challenge for us, one of the real challenges was to reach the African consumer. What did we, what did we do uh, as a company in, in, in Nigeria? So we focus on distribution and redistribution. And it's really a streetwise Kerala war out there. You actually have to go out there and do things that you never learned in school. <laughs> <laughs> So <laughs> you can have an Oxford degree and all that, but out there, it's a different world. Right? You have to be really street smart. You have to go there and apply things that are on the ground. So for us, just a quick slide to show you that we have a complete national coverage. We have 1,500 distribution and redistribution, just vehicles that we own on our own. We have 3,000 master salesmen and women. And we have three levels of uh, value trade chain. 19 warehouses, 1,000 distributors, and blah, 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 I can go on. But more importantly is this. When you employ people, you are actually creating the social economic benefit in the country. So we don't just look at doing business. How do we spend time investing in human capital? How much time do we spend? So a lot of you come out here to Oxford. We can't, at the moment, uh, afford Oxford, Oxford graduates, but we have looked look at people from Asia. We have looked at people from Africa who we get to join us on an internship basis first for two years, and then we get them to join the group on a full-time basis. So we have done that more within Africa and India recently, and we've been very successful. So the group in Nigeria alone employs 8,000 people today. So <laughs> Africans are very innovative. If you can't find a helmet, use a pail. <laughs> and we find solutions to move our cargo no matter what the cargo is. <laughs> For me, Africans are very happy people, okay? the most happy people in the world. And if you are willing to come out there, be ready to experiment, be ready to commit. Because in Africa, if you do things differently, you do it rightly, you will succeed. And the journey will be full of fun, as you can see what we've gone through. And before you know it, Africa will embrace you. Thank you, everyone. I don't have to stand by. To no, you can stay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, let me just say it's it's re it's really an honour and a privilege to to come and share some views. Um, I must say it's always difficult to talk about the world in five minutes. It's uh, 
it's, it's a very complex place. Um, it's, it so happened uh, for Tursley ters that uh, I met Harish, I think, in 2000, 2001, uh, in Nigeria. Uh, and Acha I've actually worked with, you know, over the years. Um, maybe, I think, just to, just to give a little bit of background, um, I am drawing primarily from my experience at MTM over the last uh, uh, 10 years when, when I see over there. Um, but I do sit on other companies, Anglo-American and BP, and they do a lot of work around the world, so I, I think that's, that's hopefully relevant. Um, MTN itself um, is really a young company in, in many respects. Um, the company was only really started in, in 1994 and um, has since expanded to uh, 21 countries uh, in Africa and the Middle East, all the way to Afghanistan and Syria and Iran and Cyprus and, and all the difficult places. But I think it's, it's really provided, you know, um, a deep sense of um, um, experience and, and vantage in, in, in the world. Um, let me start off by saying that, um, you know, I, I think it would be very perilous and, and, and quite an error of judgment to give the impression that there's really a one size fits all um, when you come to scaling business in, in Africa. Um, of course, it's inescapable that uh, there's commonality of themes across companies and, uh, and, and sectors. But ultimately, uh, the global expansion of a company is very much company specific. Um, and has got so many wide you know, factors that, that affect that. What I've tried to do is to try and answer some of the questions that I think you posed in, in your brochure. Um, in looking at the opportunities in Africa, I think it's very important to put into context that there have been a number of geopolitical events, I think commencing with the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 80s, uh, followed by the, shall I say, the opening of African countries to, to, to democracy, uh, debt forgiveness, uh, in the 90s, I think, was quite a, a major event, uh, and so on. So all of that really provided a very conducive or enabling environment for these African countries to expand. So if you look at the 30 multinationals, you didn't name them, so I'm not too sure which ones they are, um, and the absolutely spectacular growth they've experienced, um, you cannot look at that outside the context of these events, because I think it's, it's, it's fairly important. And of course, um, it all came off a very low base. Uh, you must remember that pre-70s, uh, the economies were actually very, very slow and small and, very, and not, not growing at all. So I, I do, however, think that um, if the projected demographics to 2015, um, you know, have to be, um, taken at, at face value, um, even though you won't see the 30% pass compounded growth, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't at least achieve um, growth in the early teens compounded for the top 30 multinationals. Because of course the, the, the growth, uh, the base is, uh, is increasing. Um, there'll always be unforeseen catastrophic events. Uh, there's always, you know, for instance, we've just gone through Ebola. Uh, and whatever political instability you know, we may experience, I think uh, Acha spoke about you know, out of the 25, there'll always be five that bomb out. So nobody can, can uh, uh, unfortunately uh, model for that. But this is on the assumption that we, don't, we have fear of those events. I think the second issue that was raised uh, is about differences in regulation and infrastructure and culture. Um, I must say, I don't see those as a barrier to, to expansion. Yes, one has to accept that there are challenges uh, to be addressed, but on the con contrary, I think cultural diversity uh, compels the companies to start reflecting that in their own structures. Um, when MTN moved off the blocks in 1994, it was 
predominantly a South African company, predominantly uh, at senior management, uh, um, a white South African company, if I can put it that way. But in 2015, we've got over 50 nationalities working for the group. We've got South Africans working in Uganda, Ugandans working in Nigeria, uh, Nigerians working in, in, in Syria, and, and so on. So we've really found that to be an incredible asset, uh, that issue of diversity. And it's really enabled us to be able to address uh, the cultural uh, um, challenges that we may find you know, uh, in different parts of, of the world. Um, so I think I should say that um, infrastructure, cultural differences, and regulation, um, if you've got an innovative team capable of being resilient, that is really how they become first, if they can differentiate themselves better than others. Coming to the issue of uh, at what pace or rate uh, a company can expand, um, you know, once again, the only limits are the clarity of your vision. Um, if you start off with a fairly succinct and clear vision, you are really only then limited by um, your balance sheet and your assessment of risk and viability uh, in, in the various markets. Um, and, I, and I should say, being able to adapt you know, quite, quite rapidly to the change circumstances. Strategies, uh, going country to country, of course, you move from the macro to the micro. Uh, and again, as I said, it's very company specific um, and, and really comes back to what is your vision, what is the business model, uh, and do we actually have the financial capacity and the human resources capacity to be able to actually effect an entry strategy into these markets. And as usual, there's a very wide range of factors and parameters and, and considerations that go into determining your trajectory. Um, I think we were just talking, Catherine, a bit earlier. You know, a South African breweries went in one direction. I think they went out of South Africa, then into Europe first, then into the US, and then you know, back into Africa. Yes, they were in certain countries like Kenya and so on, but they moved in a very different way from, let's say, the way that MTN went. You know, we went out of South Africa, East Africa, West Africa, and then into, into the Middle East and, and, and so on. So um, there is no right or wrong answer in, that, in the trajectory of that expansion. It is really, really determined by, firstly, you have to keep on asking yourself, <clears throat> are we sticking to our knitting as far as the vision is concerned? Uh, and that is not static, it, ch it changes from time to time. Um, does that market have uh, the projected growth and size that can actually justify the move? Uh, and uh, most importantly, are the hurdle rates high enough to justify um, you know, as putting in the capital, which is always uh, highly contested. So you need to be significantly above your cost of capital from a hurdle rate perspective, but also, you know, you're always competing, um, you know, for where you deploy that capex and so on. And then maybe lastly, um, <clears throat> I think a fairly important question was raised as to what is the balance between standardization and localization. Um, this is obviously a very hot topic and, and, and it's an endless discussion because all companies are looking for that optimum point. Um, and I, I should say that generally there's tension and trade-off between doing what is commercially and operationally optimum for the company, you know, on the one hand, uh, and doing what is politically desirable uh, uh, an imperative in certain jurisdictions on the other. And finding that sweet spot is, is always quite a challenge. Um, so I think in, in, in short, um, as I say, putting everything in five minutes is, is, is a bit of a challenge. Um, I, I would just summarize by saying um, clarity of vision for us was absolutely essential. Um, you know, we decided that we were going to really become the leader of 
telecommunications in emerging markets. I can tell you right up to the day when we had that strategy session uh, in Livingstone, Zambia, <laughs> where we sat for two days and, and spelled that out. And we said, look, if we just stay in South Africa, these are the, the cons and so on and so on. And of course, once we set out that vision, we were then, how on earth do we get from A to Z? Uh, two years afterwards, there was a mobile license being issued in Saudi Arabia and Iran, as an example. Uh, we pitched for both. We didn't get Saudi Arabia, we got Iran. Uh, Iran is almost 90 million people. Yes, we went there, things were very difficult, and of course the current sanctions were not as, as difficult as they are now, it was 2003. But the reality is that if there is a settlement, you know, we would end up essentially with the largest telecoms market in the Middle East, with arguably um, the largest uh, middle class and educated middle class. And it has now become the third largest contributor to earnings to the group, you know, outside South Africa and Nigeria. Now, of course, if I had to have listened to all the naysayers, we wouldn't have gone anywhere close. In fact, we wouldn't have gone to Nigeria. Exactly. Um, because when MTN went into Nigeria, the, the share price was um, decimated uh, in 2000 and 2001. Um, today, the company's got a turnover of, I think, around $12 billion, uh, over 220 million subscribers you know, online, from Johannesburg all the way to Kabul. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, you, know, you know, most importantly, once you have that live platform, you can then build on it uh, in different areas as, of course, the digital divide gets closed and we move from voice to, to other services. Um, so quite a long topic and discussion, which I'm sure I, I can't do justice to in, in five minutes, but hopefully that can give you a context for us to, to, to engage. Yes, thank you very thank you. much. Excellent. So now let me begin with you, Mr. Nthlaiko. Yeah. Um, let me ask you, so I've read analyst reports that suggested yeah. that in about 2000, mm -hmm. people were suggesting that there might be only maximally about 5 million yeah. um, cell phone subscribers in Nigeria. Obviously, there are probably 5 million cell phones in this room at the moment. Yes. Oh. <laughs> How did you and MTN, sitting in South Africa, begin to understand the Nigerian market enough to make what ended up being a huge and successful bet in that market? Yeah, well, the, the simple answer is we didn't. Um, and in fact, you know, that, that scenario that you've outlined is, is strangely not unique to Nigeria. Um, in South Africa itself, where MTN started, um, I was still with the investment bank uh, when MTN got the license. That was, uh, yeah, 93. Um, the projections were completely way off um, in the sense that people just simply did not understand the extent to which mobile telephony would become ubiquitous and become an integral part of life. So when we went into Nigeria, it was a very, very similar case. In fact, in Nigeria, the deviation from the expectation was even higher because in South Africa, you had higher purchase, you had, um, you know, very sophisticated bond house market and so on. So, so the stats were very, very meaningful. Whereas Nigeria was very much a cash society. And the only real stats that you got were from the World Bank and IMF. And they're totally wrong. <laughs> so, so essentially, we thought we will have uh, 20 million subscribers in Nigeria after about 30 years or something like that. <laughs> Uh, and of course, MTN alone now is close to 50 million subscribers um, and so on. So the simple answer is we didn't get it right, and, and, but the learning curve was on an iterative basis, so where every year our business plan improved and improved and improved, but we're still not there yet. Hmm. Interesting. And I'll, I'll now pose a sort of a similar question um, to the other panelists as well. And I just wanted to, to say that in Nigeria, there hasn't been a census that hasn't been contested on political grounds since independence. And so, as you noted, mm -hmm. when you look at World Bank data and IMF data, 
it's not only that we don't know what the population is, but because of the large black market, we also don't really know what GDP figures are. So when people talk about GDP per capita, we don't know either the numerator or the denominator, which obviously makes it very difficult to plan. So how do you go about understanding data, um, and in some cases understanding data to be able to sell to groups which are not even being counted, um, and in other cases to sell to clients or to make clients understand what the situation is on the ground? Actually, what, what we do is we do our own research. Mm -hmm. So because of our consumer business, we are able to reach out, out there and actually do a better estimate than the IMFs and the Nielsen's yeah. and all that because they're yeah. not on ground. Yeah. And because we're on ground, we can actually gather this data through point of sales, through redistribution, through the uh, detailed points that we have, about, uh, almost 700,000. So we gather information from there and then collect it and use that as our base. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would say uh, two things. Yes, yeah. so we do quite a bit of primary research. Uh, but it was also, you know, the more you do, the more you're in the market, you learn more, right? So I think part of the value is we've been active in Nigeria for the last 15 years. And part of the value to our clients is we know how to get data. We know how to interpret it. We know how to benchmark, you know, what India looks like, what Malaysia looks like, what Brazil, da, da, da. And so where could Nigeria fit in there? Um, so that's one around, you know, just the skill, learning that skill. But secondly, it really comes down to, I would say, you know, uh, I think it's about iteration, right? So it's not about you have to get it right, right? I think in many developed markets, you know, when we work on these client things, like, okay, you have to get it to 90% right before you try to go implement and test it. Yeah. I would argue in many African countries, I call it 60-40. You get it sort of 60% there, and then you go in and try it, right? And then you pilot it, and it doesn't work, and you learn, and you tweak, and you tweak there, and eventually that's how you, because that's the way to get things going, right? If you wait for the 90% answer, you'll just never get there because you just don't have enough data to get you to that level of precision. Mm. And let me ask you, Ajit, how do you sell iteration to your clients? So presumably some of your clients want to come in, they see the size of the market, and they want really quick gains, really quick things that they can show that they've done. How do you sell that iteration? Well, first, I don't sell anything to my clients. Of course not. Um, I apologize. Uh, I, 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 help my clients, I help my clients to, to be successful and have more impact. <laughs> Um, How do you advise your clients to understand iteration? <laughs> no, I, I think, um, um, I'll put to Michael talk about that, but, but, but I, I think honestly the answer is, for us it's the value of having been there and having done it many, many times before, right? I would say, you know, whatever problem, you know, any client faces here, you know, you know we have many other clients who face similar problems around the world, so there's a, there's a lot of learning you can bring in. Uh, but part of you know, our value provision is more about capability building, because for us it's about not going out and getting the answer. So I'll give you a sense. In Nigeria, and this is public knowledge, we worked with the tax authority last year um, to increase tax revenue. And what we agreed with them and the Minister of Finance was to say, look, um, if you look at the last three years um, and you look at the budget for the tax authority, they basically delivered between 98 and 103% of the budget. So generally they deliver the budget. Right? So let's agree that the, the baseline is the budget and that we will help you raise an, an additional $500 million above the budget, right? But the way we do it is not, you know, McKinsey consultants going after tax authorities. We're actually gonna build capabilities within the tax authority. Um, we built a bunch of tools, we trained them, and, and through that last year, and it's against public knowledge, we actually delivered $700 million, right, when the target was 500. But the value there is really working through people, and it takes longer than if you did it yourself, but that's how you make it sustainable is working through them, empowering them. And that takes a lot of time, capability building, training. But eventually, you know, then that sticks with them and then we can pull back and they can continue raising even more money. That explains why I had to pay more taxes last year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <yes>. So, I <laughs> clearly can see uh, there's some Bruce clients here. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, there are. I, I, I was, I was going to say that, and, 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 and this is good for consultants. I think Catherine, probably the question was, you should be asking actually is, you know, how do you get the information from the client, repackage it in such a useful way that the client is quite happy to have it back? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's true. It's consultants and business professors yeah, who know how to do that. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> okay. Uh, so let me ask them, is it only the big guys who can do this? Because what you're each describing are things that you really have to have a lot of knowledge, a lot of previous experience, and sort of a, a lot of resources to accomplish. Is this something that small, 
entrepreneurs that small sort of um, individuals or small firms working in one country can reasonably expect to do moving into another country? Or is it just something that somebody who can afford to hire advice from McKinsey or some other place can, can do? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, my humble opinion is that you know, the fundamentals, whether you're running a shop with 20 people or you're running a global company with 35,000 people, the fundamentals are always the same. Um, and it's really just a question of scale. Uh, but if you look at the core of what you're doing, it's unchanged. Um, as much as the guy who's running a shop of 10 really, really need to understand his clients. Yes, we are selling maybe to 50 million people. We really have to then ensure that we improve on the primary research of really you know, understanding and segmenting the market to get quality data, which by the way, we should be selling back to the World Banks and the IMFs, um, and, and so on. So I think that's the same. If you've got 10 people, um, they're not all the same. Getting huge harmony within those 10 people to get you know, optimum output and production uh, is key. The same thing happens with the 35,000. You might have Nigerians and Iranians and South Africans and Ugandans. You do need a formula that enables them to feel part of the same DNA to be optimum. Obviously, it's far more difficult than the guy with 10 guys in the shop, but it's, it's very much the same principle. So um, I'm just saying that it is the same. The scale is different. That's the only difference. And Mr. Rossman, let me ask you, when you mentioned the knowledge that you acquired about whether or not to put smiling people on your wrappers in the south and people in you know, headdresses in your wrappers in the north, how did you come across that information? I mean, I know that you did local, um, I know you said that you did your own research, but how do you even know which questions to ask? I think we, we, we basically went out there and did a lot of research. And I'm basically saying that it's on-ground research, right? And it's understanding the cultures. A lot of times, Multinationals, I think, when they come out to Africa, don't spend time and effort understanding the cultures. Mm -hmm. They sell a product that is sold in Europe. You sell a milk that is sold in Europe may not fit the African culture. Right? So you have to really go down there on the ground and understand what do Northerners eat? What do the Southerners eat? What do the Easterners eat? And the eating habits are different. The buying habits are different. You know, it's, it's very culturally different. So unless you devote time and spend time behind this, you cannot have it right. So even for us products, when we make local products, for example, in our noodles, we do different flavors. We do flavors that caters for the north more than the east, and some for the south that is more spicy. So it's, it's a difference. I see. Terrific. Um, so let me shift gears for a minute and ask, so as each of you were giving your presentations, there were a number of things that were surprising to the audience. Why is it that we don't hear these success stories more frequently? Why is it that we are off, in many cases, by an order of magnitude in thinking about the number of billion dollar a year businesses that are operating in Africa? And why is it that we don't hear all of these success stories in places like Britain, in places like the US? How can we change that? Well, that's because you've got BBC and CNN and exactly. Fox. Exactly. Uh, so I, I think that's a calamity um, to start with in the sense that um, a lot of uh, the views of Africans is really in, on a mirror that's held up by somebody else. Um, so I, I think that um, you know, if I was 20 years young, I'd, you know, I'd probably be looking at getting into media in a very, very different way, in the sense that um, I, I don't think that you can have a renaissance of anything anywhere in the world which is not accompanied by a media or a mirror, if you like, that reflects that. Mm -hmm. So I think that is really the problem. Um, I haven't studied their numbers, but if you look at you know, how much of Nestle's profit comes out of Africa, how much of um, Unilever's profit comes out of Africa, and so on and so on and so on. But those numbers, of course, are reflected as LSC-listed or Brussels-listed companies, right? Uh, and therefore, it doesn't give the right reflection on, on, on actually what the value is that's embedded uh, in these countries. So I think that's one reason. Um, the second reason, of course, is that um, with the exception of, let's say, the, the JSC and the Nigerian Stock Exchange, um, you know, Morocco and India, 
sorry, and, and Egypt, um, you don't have a large expanse in terms of showing those businesses. So uh, you can go on AIM and LSC with a very small company, but you know, to take an example, um, the only time you see what the value of Dangote flowers was, was um, you know, when Tiger Brands bought it, <laughs> um, even though Tiger Brands might, you know, might have a different view on value today. <laughs> but um, until that company was actually purchased and was reflected in a listed stock, nobody had any idea as to what its value was. Um, so I think those, those are two re reasons amongst many, but fundamentally, I think there needs to be a different way in which Africa reflects itself, which is not reliant on foreign media. I think the world has not understood Africans, you know, and they haven't paid enough time and attention understanding Africa. So for us as a group, what we have done is we have actually created in Asia, in Singapore, the Center for African Studies at the Nanyang Technical University. And basically just to get them into understanding what is Africa all about? You know, it's, it's like when we came out to Europe, you know, you ask people where is Singapore, they tell you oh, Singapore is part of China. It's, it's only now that they understand that Singapore is a first world country. But you know, 30 years ago, you ask anybody about Singapore, you know, it's, it's a small uh, village somewhere in China. <laughs> so I think that's where the problem is, yeah. perceptions of uh, what Africa is all about. No, I agree. I mean, I think two thoughts on that. I, I totally agree with you. you know, I think um, you know, we have to learn to tell our own stories, right? That we need to stop relying on other people to tell our stories for us. Um, remember, you know, when we put out the lines on the movie report, you know, I always said, when people spoke about China and India, they only spoke about opportunities, right? But they have a ton of challenges, right? And so we set out to say, look, we'll put out a report that focuses on Africa's opportunities, right? And a lot of people are like, well, but what about this? What about that? Well, I like, find we'll recognize the challenges, but let's put out something that's more positive. And I think, to put one's point, until you know, the media, we actually control the stories we tell and, and we go out and tell them. Nobody will tell them for us, that's one. The second thing for me, I think part of the challenge is back to, and this is one of the big things I've been, you know, working on for a while now, is this whole talent mobility, right? We don't allow each other to travel across the continent and actually discover these stories, right? So, so how many of you are tired of needing to get a visa to travel to another African country? Yes. Right, there you go, right? And so, you know, this is, a, this is some work we've been doing, I've been working on with the World Economic Forum and, uh, and the African Development Bank, because we always complain about it, but actually nobody knew the facts, right? So the facts are, so we basically went and did a big database, looked at every single African country and how easy or hard is it, how many visas you need to travel to other African countries, right? And so who can tell me, which is the, the best passport to have in Africa to travel across Africa? No, 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 in, an African passport, African. <laughs> <laughs> Within Africa. <laughs> South Africa is wrong. Wrong. Mauritius. Mauritius is wrong. Egypt, no. All right, I'll tell you. It's, a, it's Côte d'Ivoire, right? Côte d'Ivoire is the best passport to have. It, 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 with a Côte d'Ivoire passport, you only need visas for 41% of African countries, all right? <laughs> what is the worst passport to have? <laughs> Nigeria? Nigeria is not, because you have ECOWAS. You, you have the whole of ECOWAS. <laughs> Somalia. Somalia, yes. Somalia is the worst. Somalis, Somalis need visas for 75% of African <laughs> countries. By the way, no African needs a visa to go to Somalia. Now whether you want to go there or not is a different story, right? Um, but so we've been working at this. Um, so a year and a half ago when we started this initiative, there were only five African countries that allowed Africans to travel there without a visa, right? And we've been doing this with the WEF and getting a lot of um, uh, uh, getting the word out, and we had a big session with President Kagame and Aliko and a bunch of other people, the President of the African Bank. And now, actually, the good news is a year and a half later, we have, we were at 13 countries until Senegal announced uh, last month that the opening up the, 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 um, the country to everybody, right? So now we have 14 countries that allow us to travel without needing visas. And, you know, our goal is to push it to get to 26, 27, eventually to 54, right? But I think that's part of, you know, the inter africa trade being at 12%. These are all things that we tend to overlook, but fundamentally are at the, at the root cause of why we don't tell our stories, we don't travel, we don't work close with each other. Perfect. Actually, it's interesting you mentioned about visas because the best passport to have to come to Africa is actually Singapore passport. <laughs> because you can go to 50% of Africa without a visa. Yeah, exactly. 
50 percent. 50 percent. Terrific. So we're going to open up for audience questions in a moment, and I'll ask you, if you have questions, I'll ask you to come and make a line here so that you can use the microphones down here. So if you can just come. No, you, you can go. All right. So, so hold your questions. I have one last question for the panel before I let you guys ask, which is there are lots of young people in the audience who are imagining what their careers in Africa will look like and imagining being people to build the Africa that you guys have envisioned and have helped us envision. What advice would you give them? at the start of their careers? Either if you could do something differently at their age or as the next generation of African leaders who are going to build the continent into the end of this century and perhaps the beginning of the next one. Being, being, the, being the oldest, you start first. <laughs> okay, um, look, I, I think that, uh, you know, clearly when, when we left, university, we were basically saying, you know, what firm can I work for? And that is absolutely the wrong question to ask today. Yes, you have to be realistic, you need to get experience and so on. Um, and, and therefore you might want to go and work for DuPont Engineering or Goldman Sachs or whatever. But this has to be perceived as, you know, a stepping stone. Uh, and therefore it's a fundamental or paradigm shift in how you look at the world. I think that's, that's one issue. The second one is that, uh, of course, um, you know, I know, you know, Africa rising is a, is, a, is, a, is a theme at the moment. There have been many mirages and false alarms on that, but I generally believe that this time it is for real. So um, as a, a youthful person, I get the best education in the world, but uh, I would then hit a beeline to you know, any African center and spend time and effort there. And, and, and clearly, as I said in, in my short presentation, um, if you look at the de demographics, you know, growth is all about demographics in the end. Uh, if you are in Europe and it's growing at 1% and there's no youth, uh, eventually who's gonna pay for the pension fund? If there's no pension fund, the amount of money they have to, to, to invest in infrastructure and so on becomes less and less. In Africa, it's the exact opposite, is that we're still very much on that up curve. And in fact, um, if you look at a number of stats, um, in the next 60, 70 years, even though, of course, China is much, much bigger, Africa will still be the fastest growing population and add the most number of people relatively. So you've got all these fundamental aspects, and we're don't, not even starting to talk about resources and, and so on, that basically say that's the part of the world you need to be in. And secondly, yes, get as much as you can from somebody else, but you should really be talking about starting your own business. Whereas we came, you know, being very glad to be employed by somebody. Um, and I, I think that's, that's the difference. Yeah. I think Putuma summed it up very, very well. Uh, but I was going to ask Lekki, which is the country that, that has a higher return in Africa? That has a higher return in Africa? Because for me, the highest return is in Africa. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it's the region. I mean, the region, it's, uh, I think it's, it's uh, East Asia. East that Asia. Has more, return on investment as a region. Right. As a region. Yeah, as a region. It's as a region. I mean, but, but, but Catherine, to your point, I mean, I think, you know, just two thoughts from me. One is, I always say, you know, um, we've had three generations of African leaders before us, right? We had the generation that brought us independence, right? And the Kwame Krumahs and Julius Nyerere's of the world. We have a generation after that that basically destroyed all of that, right? Um, we won't talk about them. We have the current generation, right? And what do we say about them, whether it's an Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, a Kagame, people like that even a Kaburuka, who really brought stability and has brought us growth, right? So, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we were not growing at all. They brought us growth. They brought growth back on the continent. And I believe our generation, our role is to bring prosperity to Africa, right? That's what I think we, we should be doing. Uh, and the question is, how do you then do it? And, um, and I was, you know, a question I asked myself, which is very important for me personally, is, you know, would it have mattered to Africa that I lived? And I just think it's something that we should all ask each other because I think it's up to us to transform things in Africa. We can't wait for other people to do it. And it could be you know, something small helping a few people. It could be you know, building a school. It could be using, working for a multinational, but leveraging them to make a difference in Africa. But really being able to think about you know, what am I going to do, all of us here, to really contribute to making a difference on the continent. 
I was actually very touched today when I attended the uh, event where they showed the 12 innovative, uh, what was it called? Innovation. Sorry? The innovation group. Yeah, that for me is commitment. People sitting in Africa and wanting to do something and making a change and making a better life for Africans. And it was not just Africans doing it, it's people from all walks of life who came to promote their products. That was really incredible. I salute you all. Great, thank you. All right. We have time for a few questions. If you can raise your hand, and we'll get a microphone to you. Okay, we have two questions. Do you want, should we start in the front? Thank you very much for your very interesting session. My name is Ali Mabubakri. I'm the CEO of TechSEM. And we partner with top universities, including Oxford, to train government ministers, CEOs, and chairs of boards from Africa. My question is a bit um, personal. Um, I wanted to ask um, maybe members of the panel, what do you think um, would be the best approach? You mentioned that it would be good for you know, business people operating in Africa to go to Africa. One of the big markets for us is Nigeria. Because of my make the makeup of, of my age, when I speak with clients, they will not listen to me. But when they come on the program, and they see me, they say, it's you that's been talking to me. I wouldn't have come if I'd known it was you. <laughs> and then when after the program, they then say, they say, oh, it's a great decision I made. So how do you think one can overcome such barriers or such um, you know, stereotypes? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll take one more question before opening it to the panel. Um, let's, let's take a over here, this one. Yes. Hi everyone, my name is Tessie and I'm Kenyan. My question is to any of you. I, we've heard a lot about how multinational corporations can come into Africa. What I'm interested in knowing is how can African businesses win and keep the hearts of Africans and ensure that we become you know, as global as other multinational corporations? Thank you. Any of you can answer either of those. I mean, I, I, I can try to start um, with your question. I mean, I, 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 I always felt I faced the same issue, right? If you're, as, you, know, I, you know, as an advisor, and you're advising people who are much older than you who probably have children close to your age, and, and, and how do you get them to listen to your advice? And actually, I, f I found that um, <laughs> a number of things. One is, I think, especially in Africa, you know, and a lot of people you know, people at the senior level are quite lonely. Right, because there's just nobody else they can talk to. Right? <laughs> but they are lonely, right? Especially if it's quite a hierarchical <laughs> place. And so, um, so you know, being there and a listening ear and really learning to listen, right? Uh, for me, something that has been very important. And uh, that that's one and that, that, that has helped quite a bit. Two is you know you know again it's really understanding the culture. So you know how you interact and how you push back with them when you're in one on one versus when they're in front of the whole team. Right, and, uh, and learning you know, how to position things has been, has been quite important. But I realized a lot of my fears were actually personal. It was me versus them not accepting me. And, and over time, I think what happens when you start to build those relationships, you actually, and I've been with a few people, been able to really build a close council relationship. People initially, I just thought, because of my age, I would not be able to get there. Right? So I just encourage you to continue doing what you're doing. And maybe just in some ways, in some cases, you may need to adjust a bit your manager. And sometimes I need to bring the gray-haired McKinsey, you know, 20, 30-year-old 30, 30 director who's been in the firm for 30 years to accompany <laughs> to a meeting when that's important. But in general, it, it's worked. OK. Um, I, I think the young lady's question was about, you know, how, how do we get African multinationals to be more African-centric? And is, is that right? And to win African hearts. And then to win, to win African hearts, yeah. That's, that's a quite a subjective one. Um, <laughs> let, let, let me just say that, I mean, sometimes in life it's, it's all about timing. Um, if, if, again, I can draw on MTN. Um, MTN was started really in 1994, at the same time that uh, the new dispensation in, in South Africa took place. And in all probability, I don't think that before then it would have been as successful a company as it became. But the key theme there was to position MTN with a particular worldview, which said we are an African company, we're going to go global, this is a service that we're going to provide, and we're going to be all encompassing. Now, these sounds like simple things, but once they got absolutely ingrained in the total fabric 
of the company. Whether you're sitting in Nigeria or Cote d'Ivoire or South Africa, you woke up in the morning, the identity of the company was not in doubt, okay? And, and I think that's really how, you know, you win hearts and mind. And it then took on its own momentum, you know? Now, if we were seen as a company from the Netherlands, just to take an example, um, I don't think that would have resonated as much as we did. Uh, but the fact that we were seen as very much an African company, I think Karish you know, made the point earlier, is that people at the end of the day want a level of service on products as good as any company anywhere global. So it wasn't all about the nice soft stuff. We also had a very hard edge business aspect to it that had to deliver the goods. Um, and I think that's the only way you win hearts and mind. Otherwise, you know, you end up over promising and under delivering and, and it becomes counterproductive. Okay, thank you. So I'm afraid we're out of time. The measure of a good panel is that the audience wants to hear far more from the panelists than we have time to give you. Mm -hmm. And I think by that measure, we've been extremely successful. This has been tremendously insightful and inspirational. I hope you'll thank, I hope you'll help me thank the panelists for their time. Thank you, thank you very much.